What does a pharmacist do? Well, most people might answer that a pharmacist dispenses the medications that my doctor prescribes. Now, I work with a ton of great pharmacists, and one thing that I don't generally see is excitement about pills in a vial. And this is probably because pharmacists have been trained to do so much more. So what can you get excited about in your community? To find out, let's go Beyond the Scripts. Hey, welcome back to Beyond the Scripts. I'm your host, Will Tuft with Pioneer Rx, and I'm excited for this week's special guest because this is probably a guest that you may have seen uh, somewhere uh, in uh, recent months. Uh, this guest has been on the big screen. He's been uh, maybe on a smaller screen in your living rooms on Good Morning America uh, and maybe on even smaller screens on local podcasts uh, in, the, in the pharmacy network that you may have heard. Uh, so really excited to have Dr. Uh, Mayak Amin or Dr. Mack, as I think uh, most people probably know. Him. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, Will, for having me. It's a pleasure to to finally be here and speak to you. Yeah, man. So, um, had a lot of fun doing some research and uh, kind of learning about what you're what you're up to up there. Uh, listened to a podcast that I found, uh, the Business of Pharmacy podcast. Had a great episode with you a couple years ago. Uh, definitely want to dive in a little bit more on some of the things that you and Mike talked about and uh, really learn about Skipback. So tell me a little bit about how you ended up at Skipback, because if anyone looks at your uh, your accomplishments, looks at, you know, your interest, it's a it's a really varied road uh, that brought you somehow you squeezed in PharmD in there. <laughs> so uh, tell me a little bit about how you got into pharmacy and uh, and then, you know, how Skipback came to be. So I started my uh, pharmacy career, I guess, back when I was younger, and uh, I had the opportunity to pick a job. I had a friend that was working for one of the chain pharmacies, and he said, hey, I have a job. Uh, they're looking for help, and they still are looking for help nowadays. That hasn't changed. <laughs> um, and that was like 20 years ago. Um, so I started working at a, at a chain pharmacy and got to learn about how the whole pharmacy system works. Um, it was exciting, but not something that I wanted to pursue, um, just doing that setting. Uh, and obviously, some things happen in your life where maybe you'll head back into that path, and that's what actually what happened. Um, I always wanted to do a job where I actually found uh, something that I was passionate about, and I didn't feel like I was actually going into work. So having a job that pays well is amazing, but having a job where you don't feel like you're working is even better. And um, as I went to college, I, I decided to choose University of Sciences in Philadelphia. It's a little pharmacy school, uh, actually the first pharmacy school in the country. Um, Tylenol was invented there. Trident was invented there. Some cool little things about the school, but it was a very small knit group of, uh, I guess, college students and professors. We, we had only a couple of thousand students and teachers in the entire campus, which was less than my high school. And for me, that's where the whole aspect of community and small knit um, bonds was developed and where it kind of pursued in the future with the whole independent pharmacy, mom and pop, local um, actually continued uh, to where I ended up opening a pharmacy. Uh, I actually never intended to open a pharmacy. Um, I was working for Pfizer for about six years in New York and New Jersey. Uh, while I was at Pfizer, I was doing something called drug safety. The cool name behind it is pharmacovigilance. Sounds like someone that wears a, a cape and tries to protect the drug. Well, in reality, it's protecting the drug manufacturer um, and reporting mm -hmm. adverse events. I did that for uh, multiple years and I realized that it was a job that I didn't really challenge myself at all. Um, I'd work a couple hours uh, a day and then end up asking my boss, what else could I do with the other time that I had? And that's where I also came to realize that never be afraid to actually go out and reach out to somebody, even if they're 15 pay levels above you. Um, the CEO of Pfizer was there and I was like, you know what? I have his email address. What if I emailed him? <laughs> um, and I did email him and I received a response back. Um, I wasn't asking him for a job or anything like that. I just wanted to meet him and find out a little bit more about him and what allowed him to balance his family life, what books he was reading, different things that, you know, like you would want to know from a CEO of a company that makes billions of dollars a year. And, uh, from that little experience, I actually got a response back. I got to meet with other executives Pfizer has this conference called Pfizer X, where it's 
all the innovators um, around the country and the globe that are doing different things meet up with the executives and then you have a, a little time around the city. Um, for two days, you get to hang out personally with them. Um, I learned a lot about uh, the whole world of innovation and executives and how they operate. Um, never did I actually think that I would be taking some of the things that Pfizer was making and injecting it in people's arms. And that's what happened <laughs> with the whole COVID vaccine. Sure. Um, and what ended up happening for me was uh, I worked for six years at Pfizer. Um, I was at Walgreens also working uh, per diem, just getting some weekend money in. And one day uh, I was walking out of the pharmacy and I saw a big sign outside on our reader board that said, Skip Back Pharmacy patients, welcome here. And then I asked our manager, do we just buy out Skip Back Pharmacy? It was a local community pharmacy that's been around for 50 years. And he said, we didn't buy them out, CVS did, but their patients are floundering literally everywhere. So we're trying to help them out. And I was like, you know what? What if I just drive by that pharmacy and see um, what people are experiencing? I've never seen a, like a, a local business close down like that before in my life. So I yeah. drove by there, sat in the parking lot, um, and I just observed patients' faces as they were going up. The thing that really struck uh, struck me hard was when there were seniors trying to open the door. Um, there was red signs all over the window. One day they were there. One day there was red signs on the window. And these guys were trying to open the, win the, the doors and knock on the window. Nobody was inside. And then other patients were telling them, like, these red signs mean this pharmacy is closed and CVS has bought them out. Now you have to go to CVS. And... It was the saddest day for some of these patients' lives. And I was like, for once in my life, I'm going to stand up for small, stand up for community and do something. I know it's it's hard to reopen something like that. I have no experience in it. Thanks to Pioneer, I ended up learning a lot about the pharmacy world. Um, but that's when I took the deep dive in and gave up my job at Pfizer and said, I'm going to open this place back up, even if it takes me 20 hours a day. And believe it or not, it did take me 20 hours a day for the first couple of years to reopen this place. Wow, man. So, you know, that's that's something that we've we we've definitely seen as independent pharmacies that, you know, there there's not a clear exit strategy. There's, you know, maybe the the owners are kind of aging out, they're moving into retirement or or maybe they're they're just being squeezed on, you know, slim margins and and it just seems like okay, well, the big box buyout is is an option that still allows you know uh, me to stay in the community it still allows my my patients to be served in, in some degree and um you know and, and it's uh kind of a lifeline for for some uh pharmacy owners i guess who haven't been able to connect with other independents to continue that care but even now i feel like that is um maybe not as common or or Maybe not the the even an option in a lot of places is those big box stores are crunched now as well. Um, you know they they've definitely had their their struggles in the past couple of years. So you know do you, do you think in that community like were were they planning on closing? Like what what was the catalyst for them to sell to one of those big box? Well, the many things that I didn't know about independent pharmacy might have been some of the triggers. I was never able to actually speak to the owner that sold the pharmacy to CVS. But what I came to realize when I opened the pharmacy um, were things that I actually never knew about. Because a pharmacist that's working at a chain, you are you think that, okay, the higher the cost that a medication is, the more money the pharmacy is making. So I used to think that, all right, brand name drugs, we must be making. If the drug costs a few thousand dollars and the copay is a couple hundred we must be making hundreds on this. And then I came to realize that it's the complete opposite, where yeah. um, the more expensive the drug is doesn't mean the more that the pharmacy makes. I actually didn't know about many things in the pharmacy world because at the chains, you're just literally verifying the script, making sure it's correct, giving it in a bag, and then if the, if the patient has a question, answering their question, that's it. You don't see anything behind the scenes of what actually goes on. So when I first opened my pharmacy and I reached out to some friends saying, I don't know anything about community pharmacy, but I want to be able to help my patients. That was my goal. And maybe if I knew about some of these things, like the fact that you could lose money filling a script, um, the fact that I'd have to be working 20 hours a day uh, just to meet ends, 
I would have maybe I would have changed my mind. But I'm actually glad I didn't know some of these things um, because that could have swayed me away, or could sway away any new owner. Um, but obviously, as I got in and I and I saw the first red screen, I I hit the Pioneer call button, and I said, uh, my account manager Welton Jordan, big shout out to him. I feel like he's <laughs> my professor uh, when it comes to pharmacy and um, the entire Pioneer system. Um, I asked him. I said. What's this uh, red line that shows up here? And I was, and he's like, that's a that's a profit loss. And I was like, wait, th- do you really uh, try to tell me here that I'm gonna lose money filling someone's medication? And he said, yes, that's that's correct. The, there's a chance that you can lose money, and maybe you can find a way around it. But that's when I started realizing that uh, a lot of times when we were filling these scripts, we were losing money. Um, for the sure. first couple of years, I was just doing it. And then I realized that, okay, I got to stop just allowing that red screen to pop up. Um, there's got to be a way around it. And uh, you have to innovate, honestly. Like, you can sit there and complain all you want. And there's plenty of people that do it. I'm part of lots of Facebook groups and owners groups and organizations. And yes, we have lots of things to complain about. But if you're smart, innovative, and think outside of the box and surround yourself with people who are innovative, there's definitely ways that you can get out of that red. And, um, yeah, that's why I'm glad that Pioneer hosts these podcasts uh, to bring on folks that are trying to do things differently to make sure that we as a pharmacy profession can still move forward. Yeah, I think that's one of those things that is so hard for anyone outside of of the kitchen to really understand is that, you know, the the business of pharmacy is very different than, you know, any other customer uh, and business owner relationship where you can't really set your prices. You don't have any control over what you are reimbursed. And, you know, there's so many contracts at play, you know, over what you can and can't do. Um, and, and oftentimes you don't even know upfront what that transaction is going to look like. That transaction may look way different in a couple months when you get a clawback. Um, you know, so, I can definitely see a learning curve for somebody new coming into that. And it's crazy for, you know, somebody who's been in the industry for 30 years as a pharmacist and a business owner to see that landscape completely change. So as you come from a big box store where you're probably not really looking at the financial aspect of most of those claims to, um, you know, a much different role as a business owner, you know, A, uh, how, how did you move into that role a little bit? Did you have partners? Did you, uh, take that on yourself? And then two, you know, what was your, what was your strategy when you started seeing these? Did you, did you hire a, uh, a a consultant? Did you join a group? You know, how, how did you start to really analyze the problem and figure out how you can move forward. Sure. So in the beginning, uh, because it's a learning curve for everyone, um, while the goal is always to make sure that the patient is the center of everything, um, when we had our grand opening in the beginning, I told our community that one day, uh, you know, I'm going to ask you guys for your help. I've reopened this pharmacy for you guys. And there was some people in the audience that were like there for 50 years, their, their parents, their grandparents, everyone has been going to this pharmacy for ages. Some people used to come here on a horse and carriage to this pharmacy way back to get their milk, newspapers, and things like that. And they were so excited that I reopened, but I informed them that there would be challenges along the way. I didn't know about some of these things like DIR fees. Um, But I said that as long as you guys are supporting me and willing to adjust accordingly, I'm gonna keep this place open. And I'm not gonna sell to a a big box pharmacy, um, but I'll need your support. And they have supported me uh, day in and day out. Um, anytime that I've had a struggle, uh, for example, if there's an insurance plan set that says, Hey, you can fill it twice at an independent pharmacy there afterwards, you have to get your refills at a three letter pharmacy or through the mail. And I tell the patients that, okay, this is what your insurance plan says. They're like, I don't care what they say. We made a promise to you and we're going to help you stay open. So what do you need me to do? And for those patients, literally we'll charge them a dollar more than the cost of the drug, but they're loyal to me and they're helping me fight this system of what's happening and how people are forced to use different pharmacies and such. And for those people, I'll do absolutely anything for. Um, It just shows their loyalty and commitment to the promise that they made to us to support local 
and why I've been continuing to fight. It's definitely challenging in the beginning. Um, as I mentioned, I've, I utilize that green call button on Pioneer probably more than most places. <laughs> and I kid you not, if you ask my account manager how many hours I used to talk to him a day, not minutes, hours, at least a few hours every single day, I would talk to him. And he never lost his patience with me because it's like a kid in kindergarten or elementary school trying to learn about um, not just the pharmacy system, but about pharmacy and independent pharmacy and how all of this works. And um, I could say that there was different coaches, even other owners, um, Mark from Eric's Pharmacy, uh, Chi Chi, uh, the previous original owner of Skipback Pharmacy, Rob Franco. Um, there's a lot of people that are that are fighting for independent pharmacies to stay open. And we've become a huge tight knit family um, where if we're facing an issue, um, all of us are kind of in it together and we're going to work around it together. Um, so while I didn't have the formal education or training or even partners per se to help me get through the initial struggles, um, I would contact these guys and my friends and other pharmacy owners. And that's the beauty about it is when I started, I thought that independent pharmacy owners, if it's in the same town or nearby, maybe they weren't willing to share some of these best practices with you. But then I realized that if we're not supporting each other, DVS, Walgreens, the Rite Aids, they're going to knock all of us out unless we're fighting together because they have 10,000 stores each. We don't have that. We might, even the largest independent pharmacy owner that has multiple stores does not have hundreds of stores. So unless right. we band together um, and work together, even if it's the pharmacy 10 miles away, uh, we're not going to make it. And that's where the whole independent pharmacy community came together and really was like, Mac, we see you're crazy and that you're willing to do new ideas and just keep fighting and bring this pharmacy back. We're going to help you out. And that's where they did. And uh, honestly, for the new owners, um, Facebook, there's a there's a Pioneer Facebook group. Um, it's not owned or operated by Pioneer, but there's people on there that care about each other. And you can ask a question on there and someone's going to have a brilliant idea to help. Because um, even the par Pioneer community itself, um, whenever there's an issue, it's everyone's working together to see how we can advance um, different features, different ideas. Um, it wasn't until last year where I, I've i seen Ben Jolly's name pop up all over the place on Facebook groups. <laughs> oh, yeah. And uh, someone's like, you should just reach out to him and see if he can help you with integrating DIR fees. I know Pioneer has a wonderful platform to allow us to do it, but for me to do it accurately – and do it within an hour, it was a no brainer just for me to be like, all right, Ben, can you just in, plug in everything I need to know? And since that point, we've probably saved thousands and thousands of dollars knowing that this drug has a good DI or a good GER, or this drug has a terrible DIR fee, and then making a decision accordingly um, before we were just blindly doing things for the first couple of years. So yeah, it's, it's very helpful to have that tight knit group of friends and uh, pharmacy owners and even other pharmacists that are willing to help you succeed. Yeah. I love groups like that. Um, I I'm aware of the, uh, the Facebook group, but they won't let me in. <laughs> I've actually gone in and, uh, you know, done a Facebook live with that group before, but they, I'm not in the group. <laughs> so, um, but no, that's great. I, I love that community mindset of, you know, we're independent, but not alone kind of, um, uh, feel. So, you know, as, as a, uh, a pharmacy professional, you, you've, you know, you came from a world uh, with manufacturers. So I feel like you had some great insight into the industry. Um, what, what shocked you the most moving into that? Was it, you know, the, the slim margins or the, the contracting requirements or, you know, what, uh, what was most surprising early on? Was it that, that opening order? So initially it was uh, the whole aspect of, it's easy to get people to come to your pharmacy. Mm -hmm. And maybe because I, I come from a marketing background, went to B school, learned a lot about uh, the customer approach and how to take care of people. But for me, I could literally empty out the CVS that's up the street from me. But that's not the goal because you could bring in thousands of patients and do, I talk to some owners that do 500 scripts, 600 scripts a day. And profit wise, I might be making the same as them doing 50 or 70. So it's not the quantity, it's the, the level of service you can provide. And also looking at the things, if you're doing 90 day brand name medications, you could be losing hundreds or even thousands of dollars on these scripts. Um, and it, it was a shocker to learn some of these things uh, as I moved along. 
And it was sad to see that like insurance providers view our like a pharmacist and the pharmacy team rate as like a quarter a prescription. Um, I never knew that that could possibly exist. Uh, no other service industry or product industry um, that I know of has that kind of rate. Um, and you know th that is what it is. You know it used to be ten to twelve dollars. People used to be really happy and uh, owners were there. And some of those owners, as this thing has changed to what it is now, they're leaving or they're calling asking Mac, you wanted to buy my pharmacy out? Um, and sadly, you see more and more of this happening. But obviously, anything that you can put some effort and energy into, you can change that dynamic where, OK, maybe it's 25 cents is what they value us at for filling a Z-Pack. But why am I going to spend all day focusing on that Z-Pack or filling I'm not going to be the Z Pack or Amoxicillin hub for my community. Um, sure. That's a part of our business, and you know it brings the patient in. We're here to take care of that patient's uh, immediate, urgent need. But find other ways to be innovative and to provide services that others don't, in a way they can't. Others that are you know providing these mass amount of prescriptions a day, whether it's the mail or uh, or a chain pharmacy, uh, they might not be able to provide that customized level of service to a patient. And that's we as in what we at independent pharmacies can actually do, whether it's counseling somebody about CBD um, or providing a, a vaccine recommendation. Um, we at our pharmacy, we've turned an entire room, which used to be a like just a storage area. We used to store lots of OTC products. Um, but instead of me having 10 bubble baths in the back room, along with, you know, these sponges or, or soaps, what's the point of using that space in the back room? making a quarter on it when someone can order these items off Amazon now. Um, you can't yeah. fight Amazon. There's no way to do it. Um, you kind of have to realize their model and just be accepting of it and then find ways of providing services that they, they don't. Um, so we turned all that clutter into an immuniz immunization and health room. So that's where we, we call our clinic. It happens in that room. Um, we redid the walls, made the lights, the sounds, the smells. The entire room is an experience, and we realize that no other pharmacy in our area has that. So if somebody wants to have that kind of experience, guess what? They have to go to Skip Back Pharmacy. Um, and that's where I kind of dove into and realized that let me focus on things that others are not focusing on, on and then just really go after that. And that's where, um, to this day, we might do 100 prescriptions a day, maybe. And that's great to be able to serve our patients and fill their their meds, give them med packs, be able to offer these services, but we have to find ways to provide other services. And the way things are looking right now, that's clinical services. Yeah. I mean, if, if your margins are low, if you're getting paid, you know, a nickel per prescription, um, I don't think the answer is to just do more, you know, to, to get more nickels. I, I think you have to a, you know, analyze those prescriptions and look for those opportunities uh, but then, you know, also, what are those other avenues? So when it comes to analyzing those prescriptions and seeing on the ones that you're doing, what can you control? What can you change? If you can't control your reimbursements and you really can't even control your pricing, um, about all you can do is control how you buy those. So you mentioned that GER, you know, and watching those gaps. Can you dive into that a little bit more about – you know, how those different items can, you can kind of order yourself to uh, higher margins? Sure. When it comes to some of the things that I learned about as the pharmacy stayed open was uh, the, the practice of ordering smart. Um, anyone can go to any two different stores and see the same products there, but just different pricing. Uh, likewise, we started comparing prices between different wholesalers and realized that we could be losing $20 uh, filling a script if we ordered from one supplier for this specific medication, but that might be discounted through a supplier like PharmSaver that is like the Amazon of um, pharmacy uh, prescription medications where there's about 10, 15 different suppliers on there, compares their pricing and allows you to pick the best pricing. And that's just a, a difference of 5 or $10, but that 5 or $10 will take you from the red into even making $2 on the script. Um, with the GER aspect, I'm still learning a lot about it. A lot of these ac acronyms, the AWP, GER, BER, DIR, uh, they, there needs to be a glossary for it uh, because new owners and even old owners 
many still don't have these things integrated or put into their systems. But there's certain drugs out there where uh, the insurance company could pay you zero up front and then they might pay you $150 afterwards or the other way around where it looks like they're paying you $150 up front and afterwards they could take back $300. So you want to be careful with some of those medications. And uh, when we added those fees into Pioneer and we're able to see it live, even if it's an estimate, um, it's better having a general idea than just closing your eyes to it and hope being hopeful for it. Um, a lot of owners don't have actual time to go back and see if we're getting paid for these claims or see what's being taken away. And the way these contracts are written, some of these reports that you get in the mail or in your email, no one really understands what performance network fee is. Um, or you can't track certain losses back to specific RXs. Um, it's a very complex web. And for any novice owner to understand it, it's very complicated and we're just trying to survive on a day-to-day -day basis, let alone go back and review all these reports. I know the reports are there. There's literally hundreds of reports that I'm sure some pioneer wizards are actually using. Um, but you know, don't get overwhelmed by the amount of reports. Focus on one thing, get it down, move on to the next thing. And uh, now we have different reports that actually print out each week um, that we're working on. So it's not work harder, it's work smarter. And uh, having the tools like Pioneer actually helps us, allowed us to do that too. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's it, it's almost like a lot of these practices have been built uh, on the assumption that pharmacists are too busy to to dig deep. So if you just make it a little bit convoluted, maybe they won't shop, right? So uh, you know, you you want to find the best uh, inventory solutions, but you don't want to lose your rebate. Uh, you want to fill this patient's prescriptions, but you don't want to lose money. Um, you know, but if you just, you know, dig in a little bit deeper, sometimes you could find those solutions, but it really seems like so much of it is designed to, you know, get by the pharmacist who isn't taking those extra steps. Correct. And unfortunately, the way that things are moving, um, if you go, I had patients call and ask like, which Medicare plan should I pick? Um, or can you sit down with me and have a review of my uh, medications and which plan? And when you sit with them and look at it, and then you see that your pharmacy is not listed on any preferred network, um, it makes it challenging because it's like, yes, we might be preferred by your health, by your doctor. Your doctor actually probably wants you to use an independent pharmacy. I rarely have I heard someone say that, oh, my doctor told me to go get my meds through the mail or go, go somewhere they might not have time for me. Um, and oftentimes, yes, your doctor, your friends, your family, your health might say, go to the independent pharmacy, but the card that you have in your hand, which is your insurance, might say, oh, you should use the mail. And uh, just the other day, I had a specific Medi Medicare plan patient call saying that they have to get their meds through the mail. So what I did is I called um, the specific company, and then I said, I'm calling on behalf of so-and-so patient, and we just wanted to find out, does this patient have to get their meds through the mail? They've been coming to us for years. And the first woman I spoke to, yes, they have to get it through the mail or they have to go to a chain pharmacy. Um, and I was like, okay. And then, but I was like, how can I talk to their specific plan to find out what their rules are? And she gave me a phone number, called the plan a minute later. And all the meanwhile, the patient's listening in with, with us and called the plan. The plan said, no, the, the patient can actually use your pharmacy. They don't have to use the mail or a chain. Now, the, the messages are mixed that people are getting. They might get letters saying that they have to use certain places. Um, and it's very confusing. But um, what we as owners have to do is just to get the message out. And it's not to bash insurance companies or anything. They have their own strategies, techniques, marketing. There's a reason why there's a logo on a specific card that directs people to go to that pharmacy. Likewise, let's be smart. We're, let's be smart together. Let's come up with an idea. Um, and, and it might not be through the insurance. Let's find a different way that our communities absolutely love and can continue to come to us. And for us, that was the whole immunization effort. What uh, independent pharmacies did in this country during that, um, and, and not just locally in Pennsylvania, but throughout the country, they really rose up and said that, okay, we might be struggling um, being able to stay afloat filling your prescriptions, but we're still fighting for you. We love you so much that we're gonna be willing to do absolutely anything to help save our communities. And that's what pharmacies did. Yeah. So were you doing immunizations prior to the COVID-19 pandemic? 
we were doing uh, just flu shots, uh, the okay. basic uh, minimum that we thought uh, we would be able to provide as a service to our community. Um, and even with flu shots, we also became innovative where we realized that uh, other pharmacies might have programs like give a shot, get a shot when I was working at Walgreens. Brilliant idea where for every shot that we gave, um, somebody would get a free shot somewhere, whether in this country, some uninsured patient or somewhere else in the world. And I thought that was a brilliant idea is that you tie an idea to a cause. And for us with the vaccines, it was that, okay, we did the same kind of program where um, we also offered free vaccines to people who were uninsured um, far before HRSA government fund or anything like that. This was out of our own pockets just for the care of our community. And now you have more people willing to come get the vaccine through their insurance and say, you know, I'm actually going to be able to help give somebody else a vaccine because I'm getting my vaccine here. Um, mm. And that correlated to, you know, our vaccine drives that later where we added other types of vaccines. But um, we didn't become known as like the vaccine center or the the virus fighters until it was COVID. Yeah, so it, it sounds like you came in um, right right in time to experience, you know, a lot of the struggles that independent pharmacy uh, was was experiencing and and are still experiencing post COVID. But um, you kind of stepped in right before the the pandemic. It sounds like, and then that was really an opportunity for independent pharmacy to do what they do best and serve the community where you know, really nobody else could be that effective. And independent pharmacy stepped up. Um, and a lot of people may recognize you from uh, seeing you in the media because during that time, you kind of uh, got to got to serve as almost like the, the spokesperson for independent pharmacy, uh, you know, because we all see the, the memes online that say not all heroes wear capes. And I love that you actually wore a cape <laughs> and um, because you were wearing the Superman costume, uh, really making the immunization effort fun and, and visible, which is so important. With the whole idea of Superman, um, never did I think I or our pharmacy folks were superheroes by any means. Uh, everyone that was out there fighting when COVID first hit our county, um, I still remember that day where I saw we have a something in, in the Northeast called Wawa, which is eventually going to be around the country. <laughs> Whether you know it or not, <laughs> Wawa is coming to a, a town near you. Um, it's like the local 7-Eleven, but just a lot better. Um, I looked across the, the street and I saw these guys in hazmat suits. Um, the first case of COVID was right across the street from my pharmacy. And I guess somebody had touched a gas handle or they walked into the store. And that time, whenever somebody had COVID, you literally shut down. The yeah. environment, everything got like sprayed. So that must have just happened. And the, the news came there across the street. And there I was in my pharmacy sitting like, all right, I've 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 done all I could to like transfer people's medications over, fill them, go to people's houses and start our homebound program where we take care of people's meds and med packs. And I was like, what can I do now? What gap can I fill as we move into this next crazy cycle, which we didn't know if it was going to be a month, two months or two years. Um, and that's where I, that night, um, we had a couple wipes, you know, Clorox wipes, Lysol wipes. They existed before COVID. People probably just didn't know about them. Sure, sure. Uh, <laughs> and we probably ordered one altogether from our supplier in the last two years prior to COVID. And then at that point, I, I went and went to my uh, supplier and literally ordered every single one that they had. I started looking online because I was like, all right, there's going to be certain products that people are going to be using. If I see these guys cleaning the gas pumps with whatever devices they have, there's going to be something that people are going to be using at home. Um, and I ordered as many wipes I could, literally thousands. And whether it was uh, through suppliers, uh, people I, that I knew that had connections, I reached far and wide to every single person I knew and said, I need to get every single wipe that I can possibly get here. And then sanitizers came next. Um, yep. we don't have a loading dock at our pharmacy. It's a 2000 square foot pharmacy. Um, very small. Everyone's bumping into each other all the time. But, um, when I talk about COVID supplies, uh, and PPE, the amount of supplies that we probably pushed out through our pharmacies is probably hundreds of thousands. Um, when, it, when I say there was pallets coming and there was the 18 wheeler trucks coming to our pharmacy and, They'd call and I'm like, listen, you can't come into our parking lot. Otherwise, you'll never be able to get out. It's so small. 
So you're going to park on the street, drop the pallets over there, and we'll send people out to come get them and put them right in our pharmacy, in front of our pharmacy, because we don't have room in our pharmacy. So we would get these containers full of wipes and Clorox and sanitizers. And what was amazing is that these trucks would come drop them off. And it was our patients that were actually helping me bring them off these trucks, load them into the stores. And I was like, I can't believe that this community is coming together like this. Um, there was people that literally would go home, grab gloves. You know, if it was snowing, shovel the outside just so we can continue to get these supplies. And we became the community hub at that point where it wasn't Max Skipback Pharmacy. This was truly the communities. And there were people in there 20 hours a day with me. I was not alone. Yeah. And, and these weren't... It, it was hard to find people to work nowadays. Uh, even at that time, it was hard to find employees. But if I put a cry out on Facebook saying, hey, we're looking for help with XYZ, or we expect 10,000 bottles of sanitizer, containers to come, we need help packaging them. People would just show up. It could be 12 o'clock at night and someone sees a light on in the pharmacy, they'll knock on the window and they'll come right in and help me. Um, so not once did I feel alone during this pandemic. And uh, what really was the highlight of... Uh, Superman and the costume was the the crusaders that were around him and uh, While I wore the costume it was truly every single person that was around me that deserved the costume and the superhero uh, Effort that our community put together. Uh, where do you see a thousand people come together? Um, willing to spend over a year to help fight COVID and that's what our community did we, we posted on Facebook saying we're looking for volunteers and uh, that volunteer sign-up sheet had over 2,000 people that signed up. That's that's great, man. Yeah, so uh, anybody listening, if you go to YouTube, uh, go to Google, wherever, and just uh, do, do a quick search for Skip Back Pharmacy, uh, you'll find some of these videos. Um, you'll, you'll find clips from the local news station, from Good Morning America, uh, which is uh, pretty impressive. That's a big show. Um, you know, uh, lots of different news clips and and, and media attention uh, on uh, Skip Back Pharmacy and the Superman costume that you had on through the whole uh, uh, immunization workshops and 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 visits to schools and and on site. Uh, it's really cool, and you know, again, it, it's such a uh, a great representation of what independent pharmacies across the country were doing. But it's also uh, like kind of on a on a deeper level, you know. I I look back now and I think about what a scary time that was, and so you know, Superman being there for the community, it's uh, I I just thought it was a very poignant use of uh, you know pop culture to connect with people and give them something to believe in while you're actually you know um, in a really scary time and 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 delivering hope as much as uh, you know you are hand sanitizer and PPE. So it was uh, it, it was a really neat uh, way to represent community pharmacy, and I don't think that was lost on uh, uh, on social media when you know those went viral. The great thing about the that whole uh, the cause and the costume is that uh, it actually started off with a child. There's always an initial point. No one just thinks like, all right, let me wake up today instead of wearing my scrubs, I'm going to wear a costume going to work. Um, likewise, the same case was here. Uh, I had a, a Halloween costume that I actually never wore, uh, and it happened to be the Superman costume. It was New Year's Eve during the during COVID time, and a mom had called the pharmacy because her pharmacy couldn't compound uh, a medication for her child. And at that time, I said, you know what? This is my last delivery of the year. Um, why don't I make it special for this child? And the mom said, you know what? It's okay. We'll grab it after the New Year on January 2nd. And I said, no, I'm going to surprise this kid. So I didn't even tell the mom that I was coming. <laughs> and the costume was there at the pharmacy. I don't know why the costume was there at the pharmacy. Some things you forget. <laughs> I have no idea why I had that actual costume packaged away somewhere there. But I was like, let me let me dress up as Superman and go knock on this this door. And this child, you know, obviously kids don't like taking medicine. But let's see how his, uh, how his reaction is to see Superman come to his door and drop off a medication that he probably hates taking. And I did. I knocked on the door and he literally thought... Superman came to his house. Um, and for years, like mom would text me like, he still thinks that like, you're actual Superman <laughs> uh, coming to our house and dropping off this medication for him. Um, and then that, that continued and that costume was just hanging out in the back of my pharmacy said, you know what, if there's ever a time for me to, to make a, sm a child smile, I'll wear it for them. 
and uh, it happened to be that we received COVID vaccines um, early February. And that actually, sometimes things don't, just don't happen. You don't just get lucky. Um, you have to shake the right trees. And this is important as independent pharmacy owners that we have to advocate for our profession. You have to make connections, uh, your state representatives, your senators. I never realized the importance of these folks until it came time for COVID because we were sitting on a call with the uh, Pennsylvania Dep Department of Health and there were state representatives, everybody was on there. And uh, I saw one of our local representatives on there and I had met him before in the community and had his contact information. And I sent him a text message saying, is there anything you could do to help us get vaccines? And I'm sure like everyone else probably had the same question for him because he probably was looking for the vaccine for his own family members. Um, and he said, let me see what I can do. Cause he's like, I know what you could do for this community. I know that you could probably gather people together and get these vaccines into arms faster than anyone can. And that day, he must have reached out to his colleagues at the Department of Health. Next day, I get uh, a letter because I'm sure the stack of uh, applications on the de their desk must have been in the thousands because everyone wanted to become a provider and get these vaccines for their community. But I get a call uh, within the next day saying that you've been approved and we're going to have vaccines coming your way. And I was like, I can't believe a simple text message to the right person who knows somebody can make that happen. Um, and the problem was that we obviously didn't have ultra cold freezer. Um, I was about to say those first the, those first boxes, everyone had to come up with you know extreme storage that uh, they just never really had a need for. So that was the the ultra cold freezer was a problem. It's like how are we going to get one of these? They cost ten thousand dollars. They're not readily available, so it's not like you can go on uh, go to a local store and find one of them, especially at a time where everyone was looking for them. Um, there was a nursing home, uh, a senior living community nearby our pharmacy. So I called them and throughout the pandemic, I actually tried to reach out to them saying, how can I help? We were also trying to offer our prescription services to them. Never got a call back once. This time I called them and said, can you pass this message along to your CEO that I wanna vaccinate your residents? I didn't have a single vaccine in my hand. I didn't know what I was gonna do, but I just offered about 500 seniors the opportunity to get a vaccine. He actually calls me within an hour and says, hey, Mac, um, thanks for offering to give us vaccines. Um, I actually have an ultra cold freezer that, I, that we bought here uh, for the community and I wanna give it to you. Would you have any oh, use wow. for it? And I said, would we have any use for it? Are you crazy? Like, would we have any use for it? This is the, the last piece that we're waiting for to be able to get these vaccines into a storage container. So the next day they dropped off that ultra cold freezer. Um, and at one point that freezer had 16,000 vaccines in there. And uh, it was like, it, every time we'd walk by there, there was like some things you, you just see and you're like, I don't know how this thing came into, into our building, but it saved so many lives. Um, and to this day, they actually donated that, fr that freezer to us. And once the Department of Health found out that we were one of the few that had that, then they sent an entire tray of Pfizer vaccines to us and uh, that's when our mission really began, where I said, Super Bowl Sunday, I know people want to watch the game. We have a blizzard coming in our town. And the news caught wind that we were going to get these vaccines. So the Philadelphia Inquirer uh, came to the pharmacy the night before the Super Bowl and said, uh, tomorrow there's supposed to be like eight to 10 inches of snow. Are you guys having this clinic? And I said, we'd be crazy to, not to have this clinic tomorrow with people dying left and right. And at that time, people were trying to go all over the place to get these vaccines. So I said, oh, yeah. we're, gonna have, we're gonna have this clinic no matter what. It gets no 14 inches. And if I have to sit on the street and give people shots in the car, we're gonna make it happen. And that next day, um, so we posted on Facebook that night saying, if anyone's free, medical professionals come out to the firehouse. Because there was only one of me and we have two or three staff members and students uh, that were helping us. So I was like, how are we gonna get 1200 doses into arms with five people? But I was like, you know what? The community said they're going to help me out. Let's hope that they actually show up tomorrow. <laughs> and the next morning we woke up and that costume was hanging in the back of the pharmacy still. And I had two volunteers and they all showed up. The volunteers showed up. Two came to the pharmacy and we were printing out forms. We didn't have an idea of how any systems worked. We, we didn't know how to add the patients into the system. And there were so many different things going on. But the volunteers were helping gather the things. And I, and I asked, I was like, what if I wore that costume uh, that's hanging on the wall and got to the clinic and just came with that box 
in my hand and walked into the clinic. And they're like, you'd be stupid not to wear it. And <laughs> that's kind of where our, you know, our, our initial uh, journey began. And I took that box, arrived to the firehouse and walked out. And you see these seniors that are standing in the freezing cold with snow all over the place. And they had the biggest smile probably in their life as they saw Superman walk into the building with their COVID vaccines that they were getting. And they were some of the first people in our town. And after that point, I realized that, you know, the costume and this aspect of give, providing people happiness, it's not just for kids. Even adults actually took, took joy in um, seeing someone dressed up in a costume. And uh, the costume represents many different things. For me, the S that was uh, on, on the costume, as I told uh, Ryan and Kelly when, when I went on their show, it stands for servant. Um, we as pharmacists have, have the opportunity and the, the oath we've taken to serve our community. And for me, that S stands for servancy. We had the opportunity to do many things. Yes, might have been on so many, so many cool different shows, the People Magazine, CNN, all over the place, but that was never the goal behind our mission. Um, that's great. Uh, we don't mind the media because they were actually spreading positive messages. And that's what we wanted to see. Not once did any news media outlet ask me a question that was trying to throw a curveball and get a negative aspect for a story. Yeah. And there was such a need for positivity at that – well, every day. But especially, man, I, I, I look back and just remember how dark those those days were. And, and that's the great thing is if we had the opportunity – and these folks are calling you, why not take it? And we became the go-to. So anytime the media had a question, uh, they would literally send us text message. Um, I still remember in the beginning, uh, there was one photographer that reached out to me. Uh, her name is Hannah Beyer. Um, very young photojournalist uh, that went to Drexel University. She was on the front cover of Time Magazine in her 20s. And the picture that she took for that magazine was taken virtually. So it was during COVID, so she couldn't physically go to the location, but oh, she wow. told the students how to set up the camera and everything, and that picture made the front. She happens to live locally, and she had sent many emails, calls, trying to get in touch with me, and then finally one email caught, because this is a time where you're getting 800 calls a day. When someone realizes you have COVID vaccine, you're getting calls, you're getting texts, you're getting emails, and you're missing half of these. I missed multiple calls from CNN, <laughs> and which I still regret today. Because I would have gotten to go on some of these big time shows, but it's okay. It was it happens, and the the goal at that time was to serve people and to get these vaccines in arms. But Hannah had reached out multiple times, and finally I saw one saying, "This is a Reuters photographer. Please respond to me." <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, this this isn't CNN, but this is this is beyond the scripts. It is like one level down. <laughs> exactly. So she and finally I messaged her, and she's actually the reason why. If you Google, like anytime you're going to see a COVID vaccine story and you look under images, there's a chance you'll see us or our pharmacy. And then when you look at the photo credit, it was her because the pictures that she's taken have ended up in like the top uh, 100 photos of CNN. Um, president has used them in store, you know, when he's making an address, they're, they use some of our pictures and those addresses. Um, Fauci has used them. They're literally all over the places because of the, the images that she captured. And it was never to capture these images to show that, um, look at the, the effort that these guys are doing, but more so look at the effort that this community is doing together. And yeah. to this day, like yesterday, Wall Street Journal, New York Times, people send me messages that you guys are on here, Apple News, whatever it might be. It, it's a great feeling to see. And it's not just me. It's our volunteers pictures. And that actually makes my day when I see it's our students, our volunteers team members that are featured in these stories, um, and they're all positive stories. So independent pharmacy owners, uh, you don't have to wear a costume to, to get into the news and share a positive story. Um, and it's never a brag. What we're doing is not a brag. Um, people ask like, oh, you guys must be calling the news and, and asking them to get featured. Not once did we actually reach out to them, say, hey, can you guys come cover us? They were reaching out because they realized that we had a positive short story to share. And there's enough negativity in the world, Will, as you mentioned, yeah. where people are looking for positive stories. And right now, even with, with you guys that are watching this podcast, um, there's opportunities, there's things that you guys are doing for your community, which the world needs to know. And if you don't share those stories, they will literally sit in a closet and no one will ever find out. That's what I was about to say. I was about to say, why not reach out? You know, um, your your local news agencies, they, they have an hour – a night they have to fill and, you know, a, a real story about positivity and, and what you bring to the community. Uh, oftentimes, 
man, that makes their job easier. And it, it's just a win-win authentic connection with the community. So uh, yeah, I've talked to a lot of pharmacies who have had great luck actually just keeping that door open, sending a text message, like you said, with people who do have the, uh, you know, the media microphone. So yeah, it's a great opportunity to spread our message to, to everyone. And now, and after a certain amount of times, you become their go-to. So if there's ever a new vaccine, I'll get text messages like right now, the babies and infants uh, bivalent boosters just got approved. So you're likely going to, you know, pharmacy owners who are doing the vaccines, you're probably going to get calls, emails, messages. And if not, reach out to them saying, hey, we're doing these vaccines and they might come cover. Um, at least you have some positive stories. You're going to get parents that are wanting their child to get the vaccine. So you're not going to have people like protesting. And that's the great thing about what we've been able to accomplish is as large as our clinics have gotten, our largest one had over 6,000 people in a day um, and 40 vaccinators, 300 vaccinators during that, sh or volunteers during that shift. Um, we've never had people protest. Um, and we've never had people write negative things saying, hey, this vaccine you guys are given is killing people. Um, and that's because the, the whole vibe and environment that we've tried to create with our pharmacy is positivity. Um, we don't want people, you walk in through the doors of our pharmacy, you're, even if you feel sick, you're gonna walk out with a smile because of the music that we have playing. You might come in on a Saturday and you might hear wheels on the bus because it's baby's clinic day. Um, <laughs> it's things that you would think of outside of the box. Um, and as a wedding planner and event planner that I did prior to being a pharmacy owner, um, I wanted to incorporate some of those elements of happiness. Um, why not have uh, the opportunity to integrate some of the things that people have on the best day of their life every day. So we, we try yeah. to incorporate some of those into our day-to-day uh, -day services at the pharmacy and at vaccine clinics. We had DJs, magicians, um, live bands, and all of those things add to the experience because we as pharmacy professionals or anyone watching, um, you can turn something that's boring into something that's not so boring. Um, a simple thing of right now we send out COVID test packages to, to patients throughout our, our state and over 750 packages get sent out every single week to people that um, are looking for these to test their family members. And something, uh, something small, we send out a message of hope with every single package that gets sent out. Um, just a, a, a little saying. Um, makes their day. And we've actually had people tell us that uh, it's it's our pharmacy's little messages that um, bring a little bit of joy, even if it's a patient that has cancer. We have messages on the floor that says, um, you know, you'll do better or help someone. And anything positive that we can share in our lives, I think that becomes a, a reflection of who we are as people. And that's why I could be at the pharmacy at two o'clock in the morning or uh, going to a senior's house and getting paid nothing for it but still have a smile on my face because I've realized that the, the greater mission is to help people um, and not just help people that we know, but help anyone that you meet in your day. Hold the door open for a senior, um, offer to carry someone's bags that's having trouble walking from the, the grocery store to their car. Um, when we all start adapting and doing some of these positive things in our lives, um, you realize that the happiness is not just spread to that person that you're helping, but to yourself. And who knows, yeah. one day maybe we may not, might not need to be filling as many medications, I actually encourage people that, hey, if you don't need to take 15 medications and um, you can still be as healthy and happy and do some of the natural things, uh, exercise, eat healthy, uh, vitamins and such, I will still be in business. Like, I don't need you to take 20 medications and get all of them filled at our <laughs> pharmacy to, to be happy. You can still get your prescriptions filled through the mail and come to me for your immunizations and your clinical services, and we'll still be here and happy to, to serve you. And that's what the, the dynamic's changing. And I think that um, pharmacy owners and our profession have to, to realize that we'll have to shift. And this is the yeah. shifting point right here. So let's let's talk a little bit about that. So first, one of the one of the quotes that I that I think about a lot was uh, on an early episode, Ahuna Freeman shared that, you know, her pharmacy was her stage. And and that's where she could you know really perform her arts, and uh, and I always love that idea that you know doing it efficiently isn't enough. Doing it beautifully is is really something uh, special, and and it sounds like that's definitely something that you focused on. But um, when I listened to the podcast uh, with Mike, you'd kind of mentioned that you know you you were new into this and and you were discovering these uh, you know financial hurdles and. 
uh, and how much time you were spending in the pharmacy. And then COVID happened. Um, you definitely were able to serve your community, but have you been able to kind of overcome some of those financial hardships and and make the business sustainable after COVID-19? I know a lot of – there's a lot of opportunities during – those hard times to build connections with the community and and obviously the immunizations themselves uh you know uh had an economic impact but you know have you been able to adapt that pharmacy to be sustainable in the in the months since where it's kind of calmed down a little bit sure so with the economic impact of the vaccines um if you ask a lot of the people that know me uh, some of my friends some of the pioneer users they probably uh, would say Max, the pharmacist that did 100,000 vaccines and tests and forgot to bill them. Um, <laughs> while Pioneer was coming up with all these amazing systems, and I would see these things every day on the, the Pioneer forums and the emails that we would get that there's a way to bulk upload and process. And I would see them, but when I got home at two o'clock in the morning from trying to get more vaccines or trying to find more help to be able to vaccinate the 5,000 people we have coming the next day, I did not have an ounce of energy to be like, how am I going to put these people into Pioneer? Um, how are we going to build these vaccines or anything of the sort? Um, and for the whole entire year, as crazy as people think uh, I may be, we did not build a single vaccine. We gave 60,000 plus vaccines and not a single one was billed. Um, because that, for me, that wasn't, that, that wasn't the reason why I opened a pharmacy. I didn't open the pharmacy to try to become a millionaire. I was planning lavish weddings that were millions of dollars. And I could have been happy making money doing weddings or in another avenue. But I opened the pharmacy to, to provide an impact to my community and show the forces that when everyone comes together, uh, amazing happens. And obviously, at some point, someone's like, well, you've been moaning and bickering about getting paid 25 cents a prescription and losing money on all the scripts. How about <laughs> you can offset some of that by billing some of the vaccines? And if if your community helped you vaccinate and do all of these services, you know what? Use that money, inject it back into the community. Help the underserved. Help people that can't afford their medicines. Um, make a nonprofit organization that can help uh, long term. Uh, there's a lot of food pantries and things that you can actually use some of that money that you that you can use through billing because that money is sitting in there with the insurance companies. They might not want to give it to you, but you can get it because it's there and you've provided the service. And we finally at one point decided that, okay, let's start billing for these vaccines. And then um, we missed the, the boat on a lot of them because there's timely filing windows and different things. And at that time, we didn't know we had to collect insurance cards or what information to collect, what not to collect. Sure. It was solely, if you're a human being that walks up into this line and wants a vaccine, just give us your arm. We got you. We'll figure everything out later. Um, but now we have a proper system in place and, and Pioneer has been a great tool. And some of the things that we had a lot of the volunteers do at that point, um, like uploading into our state registry that someone received a vaccine, we realized there's tools in place in Pioneer where if we process the vaccine through the system, it actually uploads automatically. Mm -hmm. So we were spending 30 seconds per patient to upload that information, and there was an automatic way to do it now. So a lot of tools have been uh, been created to help us, and now we're you know any vaccine we provide it gets billed right on the day, um, not solely for the fact of billing it, so that way it also gets uploaded correctly. The doctor's informed, the state registry gets gets informed. It's the whole process, um, and it allows us to be able to continue this and make it sustainable. Because uh, while I would love to make this a nonprofit pharmacy, we still have to pay staff members. Now we went from two employees pre-COVID to now we have about 15 students. Oh, wow staff members, um, and we've grown, but we've grown to be able to provide more services to our community. And we haven't grown just to provide more prescriptions. Um, when it comes to COVID tests, uh, like the actual tests that you perform on a patient, um, we became one of the leaders in our area. And I think over the past year, maybe 40,000 uh, people and tests we've performed on people. And that's absolutely crazy to think that there's only five to 10 people that did this along with running the pharmacy on the front end. Like we didn't stop our prescription filling aspect. We practically got kicked off our property because we would have lines that would extend <laughs> out a mile um, when we were one of the only people that had rapid antigen and rapid PCR tests. Uh, we had 18 parking spots dedicated to tests. And as a pharmacist, my role at that time was not verifying prescriptions. 
I had one of these on and I was answering every call and trying to figure out the best way and the fastest way to print a form so we'd have a runner go out and do the test, come back in, have someone sitting there um, sending out through my cell phone, you're positive or you're negative. There was no system in place of us actually informing someone how they were positive or negative without just using my phone and texting them saying, hey, Mr. Smith, we did your result, it's negative. Copy, paste, send to the next person, send to the next person. But the great thing about some of this chaos is you learn things later. Now all of this is automated. We hit one button, sure. they get an email. They could use that email to, to give it to their insurance company and get reimbursed. Uh, we use a tool called JotForm. So all of our data points are plugged into JotForm. It downloads and then we bulk upload into Pioneer. And we've streamlined all of these processes. The, the time that I spent at Villanova Business School coming up with systems and ideas, now I've realized it's not just let's just do everything. Let's do everything, but do it properly. And uh, the first day that we had the bivalent booster, I actually sat into a room. It's like a coach watching. And I had all the cameras pulled up on screens. <laughs> From the second someone walks into the door to the time they get the vaccine, they walk out. Where were we wasting five or 10 seconds? Because mm. that was going to add up as we went from doing clinics at schools and having thousands to now integrating into the pharmacy and making this a long-term sustainable model. And I learned so many different things in that hour of just watching on our pilot day of what we can improve and how to, you want people to have a good experience. Um, and a part of that good experience is you don't want them to wait. They have an appointment, they get there, they get their vaccine and things like this shirt that you guys can see. There's about 15,000 of these in Pennsylvania and probably around the world because someone messaged me saying they saw one of these in Hong Kong the other day. Um, how cool and, is that? <laughs> so when someone got get the, gets their vaccine, you know, why not give them, you go to a concert, you buy a t-shirt that costs $20 possibly. <laughs> Instead of making money on this, what about we get this shirt for five bucks, we charge $6, a dollar goes to a char charity, and then now they have something to promote. Uh, a positive thing. They have something that keeps sake. Um, and you see people wearing these shirts with pride that they fought back. And we've, we've beaten COVID in the sense of we didn't let COVID beat us. Otherwise, we'd still be doing all the crazy things that we were doing at that time of, you know, like not seeing each other, not being close and not meeting in person. We're through that phase of the pandemic. Yes, it's still here. Um, and it's become like the flu in the sense of you'll get sick, but you're not going to die from it. And uh, when people reflect and go back, they have something to, to remember. And these folks that have gotten their vaccines through us, whether it's a T-shirt, um, a card, CDC card holder, or a, a COVID vaccine sticker, um, there's lots of little things that will remind them um, mm -hmm. of the, the crazy times that we've been in. And we've actually kept every single vial of vaccine that we've drawn from. So if you come to our pharmacy, you'll see probably like 15 to 20,000 bottles of COVID vaccine. Um, I still think that there's eventually gonna be a movie that's made about this and Skip Back Pharmacy and our efforts will be highlighted in there somewhere. So I'm keeping these parts of yeah. history in there, <laughs> uh, whether it's a book, a documentary, a movie, um, there is some kind of uh, film that's coming out next year and uh, you guys might see about see it on Netflix, but, um, and who knows, you might see our little pharmacy and someone dressed up as Superman in there. <laughs> nice nice yeah it is really uh really weird to think about you know um kind of kind of the the current time and space that you're in being something that's going to be remembered right uh and i, I remember that feeling during you know the, the the peak of the pandemic like that we're living through something that uh is unusual and and is going to be referenced later so i should I should take note of this and 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 how I'm feeling and how the world is reacting because it's important. Um, and and so it is really neat to kind of make it feel like at least hopefully we've made it to the other side of that. Exactly. And, and during the the peak of the vaccines, my wife was pregnant. Uh, she's also a pharmacist, um, and she's a lawyer. So as much schooling as I went to, she decided to go to more schooling. Um, <laughs> And she works for a, a law firm called Friar Levitt in New Jersey. And this law firm is actually was created to help independent pharmacies, which is absolutely insane. The fact that she was working at Costco before, never did we think that she'd be on the side of legal aspects, helping independent pharmacy owners around the country while I'm out there actually experiencing it firsthand of what we're getting hit with every single day. Um, but, but it was nice, the fact that 
uh, my wife was there by my side. She was pregnant and she actually, you know, like many people, uh, allowed their spouses to, to sacrifice time that I would have spent with her um, to go out and fight COVID. And for those nine months, I really didn't see her. Uh, might see her like five minutes every couple of days. And uh, shout out to all the moms out there. Uh, that that little boy that I had, uh, we call him Little Superman, now is a year and a half, and we have a second baby coming in a couple of months. So it's oh, wow. crazy to think how time has flown by. I don't know if it's going to be another Superman or I got to find another costume for him, but <laughs> little Superman's already taken. So it's got to be something else now. Yeah. Maybe, uh, maybe a little superwoman this time. Who knows? Uh, speaking of time flying, our time is about up for today, but I feel like I need to go through and give like a list of shout outs of people we referenced, uh, from Mahuda Freeman. You mentioned Mark Aust, who is uh, definitely, uh, kind of influential in helping our development team during the COVID uh, pandemic. Uh, big shout out to the COVID de uh, developments that our programmers uh, were able to to get together and out in a timely manner during all of that. Um, you mentioned the Pioneer RX support as well. So, and uh, shout out to the moms. And wait until you guys in Wawa Land discover Bucky's. It's gonna blow your mind. It's a whole nother. It's a whole nother level of a convenience store. <laughs> but thanks for joining us, and uh, I want to have you back on maybe in another uh, you know twelve months or so. And I want to hear what else is going on. I know you guys are busy with the um, uh, doing your flu rapid tests, and uh, look forward to seeing what other avenues you uh, you find in the next year as things continue to settle down and how you're able to continue to serve your community. Indeed. And anyone watching, uh, we're here to help just like Pioneer is here to help us out with our software needs. And um, as an independent pharmacy owner who's been in your shoes, um, give us a follow on Facebook, Skip Back Pharmacy or, or on LinkedIn. Add me. Send me a message. Um, we want to grow together. And the only way we can do it is by helping each other out. So I'm here to lend a helping hand or at least connect you to people that would be willing to help. Feel free to reach out anytime. Thank you, Will, for your time, too. All right, man. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for listening to this episode of Beyond the Scripts, presented by the Catalyst Pharmacy Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please support our channel by liking, subscribing, and clicking the notification bell so that you'll be notified anytime we post new content. To stay up to date with all of the latest independent pharmacy news and content, follow Pioneer RX on your preferred social media platform.